All right, hello everybody. We didn't get it. got started a little bit early so that we could share everything and get to all the pages on time. I hope you had a good Sunday. All right, so I'm sharing away, getting it out to everybody. Hello, hello, welcome to everybody. So, um, go ahead and grab your rosaries if you haven't already. We'll start with the Divine Mercy Chaplet here in a second, and then we'll move into a reflection on the Gospel, and then we will uh, keep going and open it up for questions. If you have a question right now, go ahead and post it in the comments, and you'll be first up to uh, get that question answered. a couple more shares. Also, if you haven't done so, please uh, share this video, like, comment, do all the things to um, just get it out to a few more people. Hopefully, uh, we can just bring the faith to uh, that many more people. Great. So we are uh, about ready to start with the Divine Mercy Chaplet. So please go ahead and grab your rosaries and let's get started. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. 
for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, an atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Jesus, I trust in you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, to everybody who's recently plugged in, welcome. And so we've got Norma Martinez. Welcome, welcome. Joni, my cousin Joni, good to have you. Thanks for plugging in. And Katia Hernandez. So if you see there, I don't know if it showed up on everybody's um, feed, but she sent 50 stars. Thank you very much, uh, Katya. Stars is a new thing that, folk, that uh, Facebook is doing where it's a way that you can support different organizations. So essentially, stars can be converted into money by the organization, um, and it's a way to, to yeah, support and allow an organization to continue to grow um, by financially supporting them. So if anybody else would like to do that, they're very, very welcome to. Uh, that helps us a lot in continuing to make resources for the new evangelization with Catholic Link. So thank you. All right. Also, it looks like Naivi is here. Welcome, Rose, good to have you. Katharina, welcome, welcome. Good to see you as well, uh, Barbara. Great, so we just finished up with the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and now we'll do a little reflection on the readings for today. Thank you, Katya. All right. Um, so, the both the first reading, or the, sorry, the second reading, um, yeah, really, all three readings, the first reading, the second reading, and the Gospel, uh, talk about um, kind of the, the nations or the Gentiles coming to uh, to the temple to to, to really be, be a part of the faith of the one true God. Um, you know, Paul speaks so eloquently in the second reading. He says, you know, I'm speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I glory in my ministry in order to make my race, so he's speaking of the, the Israelites, jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For the gifts of God and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you once disobeyed God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now disobeyed in order that by virtue of the mercy shown to you, speaking to the Gentiles, they too may now receive mercy. So he's saying that, um, that Jesus Christ is for the Gentiles and for the Jews. And then he goes, and then, for God delivered all to disobedience so that he might have mercy on all. So, so this is kind of um, like exuberant uh, kind of rant almost that Paul goes on where he's so excited that he can bring salvation to the Gentiles because even by, by preaching to the Gentiles, uh, some of the Jews, who of course were the people of God, they were the ones that the chosen race, um, 
the, the royal priesthood of, of the one true God. And he says, by drawing the Gentiles in, perhaps I can almost make the, the Israelites jealous and want them to, or make them want to come and follow me uh, in, in running in, in the, the fullness of the faith, the, the Catholic faith. Um, and it, then in the gospel, we have this really beautiful um, and, and humble, the, yeah, humble Canaanite woman who came up, you know, and it says, And behold, a Canaanite woman of that district came and called out, Have pity on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not say a word in answer to her. So you can almost see that Jesus was, No, I'm, I'm here for, I'm here just for the Jews. And then Jesus' disciples um, came and asked him, and they said, Send her away, for she keeps calling out after us. They were kind of in the same mentality of like, Oh gosh, these Gentiles, like just, just send them away. Um, but the woman came and did Jesus homage. So you can almost imagine her kneeling in front of him, uh, bowing down, worshiping him and saying, Lord, help me. This great humility, this act of faith and of love that this woman does to, to Jesus Christ. And he said in reply, and it's, it's still kind of almost a, it's a tough response. It is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. That's harsh. To call someone else a dog, uh, I mean, even in today's world, but in particular, um, in uh, the ancient Middle East, was it was a real insult. It's something that's actually kind of preserved uh, in Hispanic culture. Now, if you call someone a dog, I mean, it's it's a it's a real insult. Um, and instead of being saying, you know, oh, you jerk, <laughs> I'm not I'm not some dog. Uh, she actually responds. She said, "Please, Lord, for even the dogs." Eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. And then Jesus said to her in reply, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And the woman's daughter was healed from that hour. And so we can almost kind of see from the first reading to the second reading, or to the gospel to the second reading, what's happening is there's this prophecy that um, salvation and in the right worship will come from Israel to all of the peoples, and all the peoples will come and worship. And we see in the gospel, look, here we, people are already beginning to have faith um, from, from outside of Israel. Canaanite uh, women are coming and, and professing their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And then we see in Paul in that second reading that he's already out there preaching to all of the Gentiles. And I know for me when I was uh, growing up, this thought of like, yeah, you know, that's great that those Gentiles, that, that they can finally have faith. That's so nice, you know, but like, I mean, I was baptized Catholic. I'm like, I'm definitely part of the chosen people. I'm, I'm part of this group that, that has always known God. You know, the, this idea of the Gentile people, the people who don't deserve this, that's for them. But actually, the reality of the fact is that most of us who are Catholic are actually Gentiles. We're the, we're the pagans. We, we're the ones who don't deserve the salvation wrought by Jesus Christ. We're not part of the chosen people. Unless you have Israelite, you know, Israel blood, uh, then you're not part of God's chosen people. And that's a real reality that we have to deal with and look at it and say, you know, I may be Catholic, I may be baptized Catholic, I may have been baptized as a baby, but that doesn't make me part of the, the people who um, God, you know, chose from the beginning. I'm part of those Gentiles. I'm part of those people that were lucky to get in. You know, based on my own descent, I'm uh, Italian and French and kind of the like, British Isles, North countries, uh, and then Native American. Um, and so based on my descent, I'm completely pagan. There's, there's, <laughs> there's no Israelite in my blood. Um, and so, you know, whenever I go and I pray before our Lord, it has to be in and through Jesus Christ, because I, I'm not of the, of the um, root of Abraham. You know, I, I'm not a descendant of Abraham. I'm only able to call myself part of the, the chosen people, the royal priesthood, because I've been reborn in baptism in Jesus Christ. And that's the case for so many of us, that really, we're, we're fundamentally Gentiles. And it was only because of the great gift of Jesus Christ opening up salvation to the whole world that we can be part 
of the salvation wrought by Jesus Christ. Um, and so that's a really big thing to, to think about that, wow, you know what, I don't deserve this. There's, there's no, um, you know, there's nothing that's owed to me. This is a completely freely given gift. Um, and if it wasn't for what the Catholic Church has offered to me, what Jesus Christ has offered to me, then, then I wouldn't be a part of this. Uh, and so it should bring this great appreciation, this great gratitude, and uh, this real love of the fact that Jesus Christ came and uh, saved us on the cross. Cool, so that is the reflection there. Um, good, good, good. All right, Katya, thank you again. And Cynthia, thank you. Jude, hello. Good to have you. Looks like Stephanie's plugged in as well. Welcome, and Susie Pierce, great to have you. Excellent, so we just finished with the reflection. Now is the time to send in um, all of the, the questions that you've got. This is Ask a Priest Live. Um, so it can be about, um, you know, the faith, the life of a priest, um, things going on in the church. Uh, you can ask about anything. And if I know the answer, I'll answer it. If I don't know the answer, I'll make something up. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up. And next Sunday at 3 p.m., I'll, uh, I'll have an answer for you. So ask away, please. Castrix, good afternoon. It's good to have you. Welcome. All right. So one thing that I'm just going to start talking about things until I see a, a question pop up. Um, one thing that I think is uh, interesting, at least in the United States right now, there's this whole big debate about um, stimulus checks going on and the role of the government in society. And it's fairly complex, and I think it's kind of interesting to think about. Um, you know, what does the church say about stimulus checks? Um, should that should the government do that? Should they not? How does that all work? Um, and so the Catholic Church doesn't make real strong dogmatic statements about uh, forms of government or even forms of economy. In the United States, we have a um, it's kind of a democracy. It's really more like a republic. Um, and we have a market economy. Uh, and so within that, the Catholic Church doesn't really say a whole lot. However, it does have a lot to say about how we support one another and how we, we love one another and what the role of the government is in providing for the, the good things for human beings. So first off, the the, the fundamental idea here is that humanity as a whole is the, the, the governor of all of the material goods in the universe. And so God, through his providence, created all of the universe and then um, maintains all of that in, in existence and gives the universe to humanity and says, here, you are to govern over this and you are to have this, what's called um, the universal destination of goods. So all of creation is given to all of humanity together. And it's humanity's job to create a just society in which everybody has what they need. And so there is, uh, from a, a Catholic point of view, a responsibility of all human beings over all other human beings. And so the question of uh, Cain, whenever God says, you know, what did you do to Abel, or where's Abel? Uh, Cain responds, am I my brother's keeper? Well, the answer is yes, because you're a human being. And so we're all um, brothers and sisters in our common humanity, and we have a responsibility for each other to provide for each other. Obviously, that doesn't mean that some people can just be moochers, or some people can, um, you know, just demand things out of, you know, outside of justice or anything of that sort. However, we do have to provide for each other. Um, and ideally, that happens actually on, on very interpersonal levels, from human being to human being. One of the other principles that the Catholic Church um, really supports in uh, what's called the, the so Catholic social teaching is the concept of subsidiarity. And so subsidiarity is that everything should be dealt with on the lowest level possible, on, the, on the, the localist level possible. And so 
really the Catholic Church teaches that if your neighbor lost his job, whose responsibility is it primarily to support that person? Well, the neighborhood, the family, um, that person's friends, that when, when somebody is in a tough time, we should support that person, we should help them. And by helping them, we are first off given the opportunity to do an act of charity, to, to really love Jesus Christ in that person. You can think of, um, I think it's Matthew, I wanna say it's chapter 25, right around like verse 30, uh, where it's the, the sheep and the goats. And, um, you know, the, the sheep and the goats are separated out and the goats are sent into the fire and the sheep are, they enter into the heavenly kingdom. And why is that? Well, it's because um, they, they clothed the naked, they fed the hungry, they housed the, um, the, the immigrant, all these different things. Um, and they said, well, when did we, when did we do that to you? Because he actually says, you know, whenever you did, you did these things to me. Um, and the response is, whenever you did these to the least of these, my brethren, you did, you did them to me. Um, and so we have this opportunity to really serve Jesus Christ in a very personal way and to love God in our neighbor uh, in those types of situations. Um, however, this isn't a perfect world. It's a very <laughs> imperfect world, unfortunately. That's where we all live. Um, and <laughs> if you want to know what's wrong with the world, start with yourself, right? Uh, there's a great quote of um, uh, G.K. Chesterton where there was, you know, in a paper it was written essentially, you know, what's wrong with the world? Send in your responses. Um, and G.K. Chesterton wrote this uh, response that was, you know, in response to the question, what's wrong with the world? And it, then he just wrote, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. Um, and that's such a wonderful thing that really, uh, what's wrong with the world? Well, I am first and foremost. I need to fix myself and then I can start looking at the other people. I need to remove the beam from my, eye, my own eye before I taking out, start taking out the splinter in other people's eye. Um, so anyways, back on. Uh, by the way, uh, please post any questions that you do have. I haven't had any questions come in, and so I am talking about um, uh, kind of stimulus checks and how the Catholic Church looks at something of that sort. So uh, where we're at right now is talking about the principle of subsidiarity, how we're supposed to help each other um, at that uh, most local level. However, what happens when something like a hurricane comes along and really everybody, all the neighbors, all the family members, all the friends, they all lose everything? Well, then we need to start looking a level up and say, okay, well, you know, the, the local area, they, they all need something. And so how can we kind of take a step up and actually help them um, from a little bit farther away? Um, and so we also need these kind of intermediate structures where perhaps you know, the whole state of Texas and Louisiana and Mississippi, they can all kind of work together to, to support people who just got, um, you know, hit by a hurricane. Um, and so that also needs to happen. And obviously, on that level, you really begin to need some, some organization and uh, some sort of a system to mobilize that many people and even a way to support the people who are supporting other people. Because a lot of people will be leaving their homes so they, you know, they can't just continue with their normal jobs and then come all the way down um, and stay in Houston or Louisiana or wherever um, for extremely long periods of time because they also have to feed themselves. Um, and so you need a system that um, will actually pay those people who are coming down uh, so that they can continue to, to essentially um, make a living wage while they are helping other people. So when we get to that level now, that's really hard to do on a private sector level. It's no longer an interpersonal thing. It's no longer a small business thing. Now you, you need this system within society. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously you can go even beyond that. What happens when there's a worldwide crisis or when there's at least a nationwide crisis? Then whose responsibility is that? Um, and at that point, you need a national response, um, something that can happen from the national level to help everybody. Um, and so, 
from one point of view, you could say, well, no, then that's what the stimulus checks are, that this is the nation helping people on a nationwide crisis, really a worldwide crisis, uh, supporting all these different people. However, uh, there's a little bit of complexity with coronavirus because while um, many businesses, many families are, are really struggling and that, that struggle is, is real and we need to pray for those people and support them, it's not necessarily everybody in a certain locality. And so we have a whole number of people who are, um, you know, for example, here we are in Nacogdoches. We've got a number of people who have lost their jobs, who um, have businesses that they've now had to shut down or that they aren't allowed to keep open because they're, um, you know, not part, they're, they're not on the list of approved businesses. Um, and, and those people need support. However, we also have plenty of other people who have jobs that have continued and, you know, really financially they haven't felt anything. Um, and so it's kind of like, well, how do we help those people? Does it need to be a government check that does that? Um, and the answer uh, is not clear. <laughs> um, because also, uh, you can look at it actually from a kind of macroeconomics level where, um, you know, the stimulus checks are not really there to necessarily help individual families. You know, most people, if they've lost their job and they haven't had their job for a month or two, a $1,200 check really isn't going to make a huge difference. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's something, they're very happy to have it, but, you know, if you haven't worked since March, well, you know, a second $1,200 check or, you know, however much it's going to be, even if you have several, you know, children or spouses or whatever, um, it's really not enough to fill in the gap. Um, and so uh, the, the concept of the stimulus checks is not so much to, to stimulate a certain family's bank account, but rather to stimulate the economy as a whole, so that the economy as a whole has more money moving through it. Um, and you can then begin to look at, well, what is the effectiveness of a stimulus check on the economy? Um, is it really within a market economy, the, the government's job to um, stimulate that and all of that? And that really kind of goes beyond the scope of what the Catholic Church has to say about it, because it doesn't really say a ton about um, you know, government or, um, or economies, as long as they're um, you know, supporting justice they are following the principles of the universal destination of all goods, that um, all of humanity has, has all of the goods, and it's our responsibility to make sure that everybody has what they need, um, and then also the principle of subsidiarity. So hopefully that uh, keeps things, or that was mildly interesting. Um, uh, I hope you all enjoyed that. And Daniela, good to have you, welcome. Great, good stuff, we've got some questions in. So from Joan. Um, Father Elliot, if I understand it right, as a Catholic, we should spread God's word. What if we shy away from doing that? that? To me, it sounds like public speaking. What else can we do? Excellent question, Joan. You know, I went and visited uh, a friend of mine just this past week, a priest friend, um, and uh, he has been studying uh, a church document called um, Apostolicum Actuositatem, and, and in that document, it's essentially how lay people, that's everybody that's not a, a cleric, so if you're not a priest or you're not a deacon, um, and you're not religious, then you're, you're lay. Religious people are kind of lay, it's complicated. Um, but if you aren't one of those, then, then you fit into that category of, of a lay person. And the church wrote a document in the Second Vatican Council explaining what your apostolate really looks like. Um, and so drawing out of that document, he talked about three uh, kind of apostolates, or three ways that lay people can really live their faith. Um, and so the first one is uh, to, uh, it's like evangelizing and sanctifying. So it's that idea of really going out and almost directly teaching the faith, um, leading someone else in holiness in a very direct uh, way. Um, then another one, so for that first one, that would be, um, you know, being part of a team that runs retreats or being part of a small group or leading a small group or something of that sort. Um, cate catechesis would go into that category as well. Uh, then the second category is um, the sanctifying of the temporal order is the fancy way to say it. And so what that means is essentially going into wherever it is that you have your occupation and directing that insofar as possible to God, or at the very least, 
so that it is a place of, of justice, uh, of peace, and of love. Um, and so, uh, like one example that uh, he spoke about, he's been working through this with a lot of his, um, his flock. He runs a really amazing uh, young adult program called City on a Hill. Uh, and with, uh, with that group, he talked about, um, you know, perhaps in a, with, with a nurse or something of that sort, um, you know, the nurse looks around the hospital and says, okay, this is a hospital. It's supposed to be healing people. That's supposed to be the primary purpose of this hospital. But because of um, economic pressures and all of these different things, really the hospital runs not so much for the purpose of healing people, but for the purpose of making money. And they just do that by healing people. Um, and so how is it that a nurse can walk into her floor and, all right, yeah, this is a business. They have to make money. It has to function but how do I put the art of healing as the primary purpose in, in what I do? And how do I influence the nurses around me to do exactly the same? That really, we're here first and foremost uh, to heal people. Um, and then the, the making money hopefully comes from that. Um, uh, so that kind of a thing, the, the sanctifying of the temporal order, um, sanctifying of the world and making it directed more towards God or at least towards justice, peace, and love. Um, and then the third thing is works of charity. And so that you can think of, you know, the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy. Um, so for example, you know, here we've got uh, the, the food pantry. Um, you can be a part of uh, the Loving Hearts Ministry going and visiting uh, those who are shut in. Um, you know, there, there's just so many different things. You can help out with Habitat for Humanity or something of that sort. Lots of uh, really good ways to um, to get involved and to, to serve in that way. Um, and what's key in each of those is that even though it doesn't need to be like a walking up to someone and saying, you know, hi, I'm Father George, can I tell you about Jesus? That, that at the depth of who we are, um, that, that fire of love, that the fire of the love of Christ is there and that we do not shy away from sharing that with people once they are interested. Um, you know, if, if you're there transforming the, the floor of the hospital that you work on and everybody's like, wow, you know, this person is really just, they've almost changed this place. They changed the culture. It's, it's such a better place to, to work now. Um, you should be able to say, yeah, it has changed. And you know why? Because I have been transformed by Jesus Christ, that I live my life for Christ. Um, and that draws people uh, to, to the faith in a very direct way. Great question, Joan. Way to go. All right. Margaret, yeah. I keep hearing and reading so much criticism of Pope Francis. It's become very confusing. Would you address this? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's tough to address a particular thing um, without, yeah, or, it, it address the details without um, looking at a particular issue. Um, you know, as, as you know, I was actually at the, um, at the election of Pope Francis. I was standing out in St. Peter's Square, um, and then I was in Rome for several years while Pope Francis was Pope. Um, and so I was absolutely in, in the fray. You know, if you think there's a lot of, uh, politics in Catholicism in the United States, just go to Rome. Um, and you know, everybody always knows what the Pope is saying, what the Pope is doing, and what this person did, and what this person said, and what this person didn't do, and all sorts of stuff. Um, and uh, it, it is, it, it becomes very, very confusing. Um, in regard to the criticisms, uh, I think there are a few principles that, that are really helpful. Uh, the first thing to remember is that the Pope is a person just like you and me. Um, the Pope wakes up and he has bad days. The Pope says stuff and then afterwards he thinks to himself, why did I say that? Except there's always a camera pointed at him and there's always a microphone around him. Um, and so he says and does things and yet he's also so busy that he can't necessarily um, make a ton of reflection about every single thing that he says or every single thing that he does. Um, and so he has to rely a lot around the people around him, um, on the people around him. And uh, that, that, that 
then causes a lot of confusion because you know there are so many people around him. Not everybody has perfect motives. Not everybody has the same vision and direction as Pope Francis. And you know he's got so much responsibility. It's probably difficult to come up with a really clear vision and direction um, for himself. And so it's tough to understand what he's doing sometimes. You know you can you can say <laughs> on one side he's the the best pope in the world, and then on the other side you can say he's the worst pope in the world. And it's you know people just have all these different opinions. Um, and so the first thing to remember is just that he's a human being, um, and he makes mistakes, and he's not perfect, and uh, that's okay. He's just like the rest of us. Um, the second thing is uh, to remember that not everything that you read about him is accurate or read in context. Um, and so he'll say things sometimes where if you read all of his speech, it's actually not that... <clears throat> excuse me, it's actually not as extreme as he sounds. Or, um, you know, he'll, he'll place someone in a certain position and he has really good motives for that. But, you know, perhaps this person, because, that person, because the person that he placed has um, great credentials in one area that he really wants to focus on, but the, he doesn't have wonderful credentials in some other area. Um, and, you know, news... They make money by n novelty, right? The, the more extreme the headline is, the, the, the more clicks it can get, the more money they end up making. Um, and so they try to spin things in extreme ways because that's how their business works. Um, now, there are, good biz there are good news sources out there. Um, that don't that aren't just out to try and you know make money and um, will do anything. Uh, there are a lot of good journalists out there, but um, you know even the good journalists sometimes because they have to be cranking out so many articles, they'll do sufficient research but not all of the research to really understand what's going on, and that'll cause them to kind of make a little bit of a misjudgment um, of of the actual situation. So that's the second thing that you know. You can't always trust absolutely all of the news sources that you read, um, and unless you read everything that the Pope says and does, um, it's it's tough to really understand what's going on. Um, and then uh, the the last principle uh, is really to to make the act of faith that um, the Holy Spirit, working through the cardinals, did choose to make Pope Francis the Pope. That's it. So. He's the Pope, and the Holy Spirit was working in that election. That also means that the Holy Spirit will not allow him to fail in matters of faith and morals. Uh, when he's speaking ex cathedra, so when he's speaking specifically in his teaching role to the universal church in matters of faith and morals, he is infallible. And so, in regard to the most important things of our faith, the Pope's not going to make a mistake. In regard to the other little things, I mean, he's a human being just like the rest of us. And so not only is he maybe going to make mistakes, he's probably and almost certainly going to make mistakes. And you know what? We're going to make it. Jesus Christ himself said the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Uh, the church is going to continue. It's going to be fine. We don't need to panic. Um, in uh, a lot of the world right now, there is a what's called um, ultramontanistic tendencies. Um, so ultramontanist was this idea of over the mountains. Um, and so in France, there was this tendency to kind of overemphasize uh, the really, uh, not even just in France, was, um, throughout Europe, there's this tendency to overemphasize um, the Pope who was over the mountains. So it was on the other, other side of the Alps is what they were talking about. So it was the Pope over there. Um, and it was, it was almost this like obsession about everything that the Pope said and did and all of that. And I really think that's the case for us right now. We had a series of really amazing Popes. I mean, you can think about Pope John Paul II, how he really made the Pope relevant, the papacy relevant in the world. Um, you know, he was at uh, times, you know, most influential people. Like he, I mean, just this absolute giant of a man. Um, and, and that was really good, and that's what the church needed at that time. However, right now, um, we've got a little bit of an over-obsession with everything that the Pope says and does. Um, and it's kind of good for us to, to not watch it all the time. And so I can tell you that for myself, um, 
while I was there in Rome, even, I just kind of said, you know what? I don't care. Not, not that I don't care, but I, I, I don't want to know what the Pope had for breakfast. Um, it's, it's okay. Uh, I don't need to know all the details. If something really big and really important comes out, then I need to read it and I need to read all of it and really understand it. And then I can go on my merry way. But I already know what the Catholic Church teaches. That's what the catechism is for. I already know what Jesus Christ revealed. That's what scripture and tradition is for. Uh, you know, I just, none of the important things are going to change. And so I just need to focus on the important things that are unchanging. And really what the Pope says or doesn't say doesn't really matter that much because he can't change those things. So hopefully that clear, clarifies some things there. Great question. All right. Good. Cynthia. Hello, good evening. Uh, I have a good friend who is an Adventist. Uh, how do you respond when oftentimes they bring out Catholics not being saved because we go to church on Sunday? How can they not like Catholics? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a complicated thing, Cynthia. That's a good question. Um, in regard to the, the, when the Lord's Day is, is it, is it the Sabbath or is it um, the, the first day? the eighth day, um, Sunday. Um, you know, the, so it's, it's slightly complex. However, what we do know is that from the earliest times, um, we actually have it in the, in the didache, which is, um, didache is the Greek word for like the teaching. And so it was, um, didache is the, the teaching of the, the 12 apostles. Um, it is a very, very early work um, from, it's dated about the year 80. So it was actually probably written before the Apocalypse of John. So it was, it was written while the scriptures were being written. And um, it has a whole number of uh, different teachings um, regarding moral things, but then also it has a lot of stuff about the, the sacraments, the sacraments being celebrated um, in the early church. And one of the things that it does talk about is the, tr the Christians gathering on the first day of the week that it was Sunday that they worshiped. Um, and you know, even Jesus Christ himself at the road to Emmaus, on the day of the resurrection, on Sunday, what does he do at the end of the road to Emmaus? He actually celebrates mass at that time. And so Jesus Christ himself chose to celebrate mass with the disciples um, on Sunday. That was his day. You know, he was actually in the tomb on Saturday, but he rose from the dead on Sunday. And so we as Christians, as children of the resurrection, um, we celebrate the Lord's Day on Sunday. Um, and so, you know, that's, uh, that's what we do. Uh, specifically, Saturday being the Sabbath, uh, you know, the Sabbath was, was connected to um, essentially all of the, the, the temple laws and we, we don't follow the temple laws anymore because we have a new and eternal sacrifice. So the old temple was for the old sacrifices. Um, and then God established this new and eternal covenant, which had a new and eternal sacrifice. Uh, and that's what Jesus Christ was doing through the Last Supper, through the Passion and Death, and through his resurrection. And... Uh, so the old temple actually in 70 AD was destroyed and it hasn't been rebuilt. Um, and from the salvation history point of view, the reason that the temple was destroyed and not rebuilt was because those old sacrifices are no more. They're, they're no longer needed. Um, and just as the old temple is no longer needed, the old sacrifices are no longer needed, and the old temple laws, including specifically the Sabbath, being the day to worship and to offer the sacrifice is no longer in force. So I hope that clarifies it a little bit. Um, how can they not like Catholics? I don't know. I think we're great. <laughs> um, you know, it's a, it's a sad thing that um, so many different Christian denominations um, are, are not united, but that's, um, that's the sad fact of the matter. That's a part of humanity and part of um, man's, man's sin and the brokenness of humanity. And it's why we need to constantly be pursuing Jesus Christ and pursuing the truth um, and, and real holiness and you know, continuing to draw, draw close to him. Good question, Cynthia. Thank you. All right. Crystal, priest-like question, because I have six sons and a hopeful heart. Excellent. Glad to hear it, Crystal. Uh, so many have 
So many of us have never lived through anything like a pandemic quite to the scale of corona. Yeah, thanks be to God, right? Um, what part of seminary training best prepared you to handle this as well as you priests have? Well, first off, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and Catholic Nacogdoches. Um, <sighs> prayer. <laughs> lots and lots of prayer. Um, you know, there, there's something that... Um, the guys who really gave of themselves uh, in prayer in the seminary get um, that a lot of a lot of people um, and even some other priests, unfortunately, who didn't um, really seek holiness first and foremost in in the seminary. You know, I think um, there are very few people who enter into the seminary not wanting to be good priests, but everybody has a different idea of what that looks like. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate. I was uh, around good priests right when I was entering the seminary and while I was in the seminary as well. Um, and I was sent to good seminaries. And what they talked about was that you know the, the, the anchor of your priesthood must be that intimacy with God. Um, and so I really threw myself into, into prayer and into striving for, for holiness. And I mean, anybody who's here in Catholic Nacogdoches just knows that I have a long ways to go on the whole sainthood path. Um, but at the very least in prayer, that, that intimacy with God. Um, and there in prayer, when you, when you draw close to uh, love himself and to the, the very foundation of reality, um, there's, there's an immense uh, stability, first off, that when everything else around you is changing, uh, your your foundation is 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 in Christ and he is unchanging um, and then also uh, as you know God more and more uh, you know human beings more and more and so um, by that that drawing near to to God um, so many things that other people consider to be these great problems and great difficulties and complications and all of that um, you know you kind of look at it and you're like Meh. I mean, yeah, the world might end, but really, we know that's going to happen eventually anyways. Yeah, you know, I might die, but heaven sounds a lot better than here, so, you know, I was kind of hoping to have a few more years here because I feel like there's some work to be done, but, you know, if not, that's okay. Um, and so really just the, it's, it's just um, that, that closeness with our Lord uh, that you can, you know... <laughs> Uh, have some some rough news and then just go and kneel in front of the tabernacle and say like well lord you're supposed to be in control so i'm just gonna sit here and wait until you tell me what to do <laughs> um that's really uh, gotten me through uh, a good number of things great question all right john thank you i appreciate it <laughs> all right margaret good you're welcome thank you Whoa, Joan, great question. Okay, Father Elliot, would you please um, uh, explain how you recognize when the Holy Spirit is with us? Uh, growing up, I'd hear if you came late to church. Oh, sorry, okay, that's another question. Joan, you got great questions, way to go. Okay, so how to recognize when the Holy Spirit is within us? Um, that's really hard. Uh, because the Holy Spirit, as God, is utterly immaterial, right? He's, he's not connected to material at all. He's outside of creation. Um, and so we don't really feel the Holy Spirit. Um, sometimes God can make feelings within us, but those are actually created feelings within us. They're not God themselves. And so you can have the Holy Spirit within you and not feel anything. In fact, um, there was a big scandal whenever the um, spiritual journal of Mother Teresa came out because in it, there's years and, years and years and years and years and years in which she talks about not feeling anything and almost this kind of emptiness and almost, yeah, she, like she, I mean, she still had great love, she still had great joy, but she didn't feel God within her. Um, and that was a great trial for her. And this is actually something that you see very often within saints that these people who we know have the Holy Spirit within them, without a doubt, um, will go very long periods of time without feeling anything. Um, and then 
almost always God gives them, you know, kind of after that time, period of, of purification and of trial, then they have these great um, uh, feelings of God's presence. And throughout it all, they have great manifestations of God working in them as well. Um, but, uh, so the answer is, uh, the most concrete one is, if you have been baptized, uh, that means you're put in the state of grace, you're made um, the children of God, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and then that remains, the Holy Spirit, the life of the Holy Spirit is within you, all the way through uh, until, hopefully this never happens, but um, the unfortunate fact is that for most human beings it does, uh, until you fall into to the state of mortal sin. So if you commit a mortal sin, um, and remember that's uh, it's something, it's a serious sin that's done with full knowledge and full consent. Um, and so if you commit a mortal sin, then you fall out of the state of grace and the Holy Spirit is no longer alive within you. Uh, thanks be to God, he knows us as human beings and we can go to confession. And so if we go to confession and we make uh, a good confession, which means that we have to make an integral confession. So an integral confession is confessing all of our mortal sins in the kind of sin and the number of times that you committed it since your last good confession or your last integral confession. Um, and so I find in the confessional, it's, it's fairly common that perhaps somebody has never um, made a, an integral confession because they've, they've never been, been told that they have to do that. Uh, and ultimately, it's really, it's the priest's job to make sure that somebody makes an integral confession. And so if you're thinking to yourself, <gasps> oh my gosh, I've never heard that before. Um, and, and you've genuinely never heard that before don't worry that's uh, basically god looks at that and says okay no um you did your best to confess your sins as well as you can um therefore those sins are forgiven um however it's the priests it's the priest's responsibility and so um the priests <laughs> that are listening should be freaking out right now if they haven't done that um and uh so anyways that puts you back in the state of grace uh and you have the holy spirit within you once again uh, some things that can kind of manifest the life of the Holy Spirit uh, is growth in specifically the theological virtues. So if you can see a growth within you, a presence and growth within you of uh, faith, hope, and charity, um, then that is a good sign that the Holy Spirit is within you and is in fact growing. Um, and uh, yet also we all have times in which perhaps we aren't completely um, you know, we aren't real hopeful or we aren't real filled with faith because we're just struggling with something or perhaps, you know, we're doing our best to be charitable, but we're just not winning right now. Um, and that's not necessarily a sign that therefore, you know, the Holy Spirit's not within you. Don't, you don't need to panic. We all have moments in which we're kind of down or perhaps we're, we have moments like Mother Teresa where um, we just can't feel those things. And, uh, you know, Mother Teresa and so many of the other saints would talk about themselves as, you know, so ungrateful and so wicked and, you know, they sinned so much. Um, but, you know, the rest of us are looking at them thinking, like, you're a saint. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, <laughs> literally, you know, some of the holiest people that have walked the earth. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what actually happens to us a little bit as we do grow in holiness. We begin to recognize our own faults more and more. And so in our own estimation, we become uh, less holy, less good, but really... Uh, what's happening is we're becoming even more holy and more good. Um, so it's, it's very, you have to be very, very careful about judging yourself to be in the state of grace and therefore filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's why St. Paul even talks about, you know, I do not even judge myself um, because we, we really end up being the worst judges of ourselves. Hope that helps. Great. Cynthia, you're welcome. Good. Joan. All right. Growing up, I'd hear if you came to church late to church, after the reading of the gospel, you do not fulfill your holy obligations. Is that true? Um, yes. So, an odd situation that we're in right now is that nobody has an obligation because at least uh, the bishops in the United States uh, have um, kind of paused the, the Sunday obligation. Nobody is required to go to Sunday Mass right now, and so that is not required. Um, at all other times, yeah, so you're obliged to attend Mass, and there are, there are three things that are required for the Mass. There have to be the readings, there has to be um, the consecration of the Eucharist, and then at least the priest has to receive the Eucharist in both species. 
And so, um, since those are the absolutely essential things, there's this kind of theological concluding, it's, it's not really clearly stated by the church, that you know, as long as you make it to one of the readings, so the last one is the gospel, and as long as you make it to the consecration, which is sandwiched between the, the gospel and the priest's communion, and as long as you make it to the priest's communion, then you've fulfilled your Sunday obligation. Um, yeah, so I hope that clarifies it a little bit. Excellent. Crystal, good stuff. Thank you. You're welcome. Alejandra, great. As a parent with small children, I try to set an example for my kids. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that's not easy. I, my sister is, has small kids, and whenever I go and visit her, I think to myself, man, you're so much holier than I am. Uh, but I find myself losing patience, yeah. And being pulled in to many ways, how do we balance spiritual life, home, and work? I want to serve the church, but I feel I am at at a limit with work, kids, and now homeschooling. Does this feeling of wanting to do more mean God wants me more of me? And if so, how can I get this done? Yeah, Alejandro, you just don't sleep, and then you can do everything. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The, yeah, it's it's a real struggle, and I mean, you're talking about um, you've got work, kids, um, and now homeschooling as well. Um, I. So I don't know all of the details of your life, but I would say you probably have enough on your plate. Um, you know, take care of your family, uh, do your job as well as you can, um, try to be a, a, a light in your job, be, be a positive person, do your job well, um, try to transform that, that workplace um, to be directed towards God or at least towards justice and peace and love. Um, and uh, yeah, teach your kids and, and teach them well. And if you're doing all of those things, I would really say that uh, you're, you're doing more than enough. Um, you know, there is a saying in, in the seminary that you can, you can be, uh, you, can, you can get good grades, you can have a spiritual life, or there, there's, there's good grades, there's a spiritual life, there's uh, friends, and there is uh, sleep. And you can only have three of those. And so you just have to choose which of the three you want. Uh, and if you try and have all four, then you don't do any of the four well. Um, and it's kind of that way when you've got you know, your family and your faith and, um, and, and your work, and then you're trying to add on other things on top of that, it just becomes too much. And so um, you know, really sit down and ask yourself, okay, which of these is truly necessary and which of them are highest priority? And then just cut the other things out and do those things outstandingly well and do those things for the love of God. Obviously, your relationship with God, things of, of your prayer life and you know, attending Mass, um, uh, regularly going to confession, all of those things, those can't be pushed to the side. Those are necessary. Um, they're actually the most important things. Um, but when it comes to things like helping out with the food pantry or starting this other group or doing doing more at the church, volunteering at the church, um, you don't necessarily need to volunteer and do more at the church. If you're just doing the things that you are doing uh, for God and with great love and with excellence, uh, then then you're serving God enough. Uh, you know, you can be a good Catholic and you don't have to be volunteering at the parish all the time. And that's something I try and talk about um, with a lot of the, the volunteers and leaders here, um, but it could definitely uh, definitely be repeated more often. It's a good question. All right, that is the, the bottom of the list as far as I've seen so far. And we forgot to recharge the iPad and it's now telling me that it's about to run out of battery. So I think we're gonna wrap it up right now. It's been great and I will see you all next week at 3 p.m. on Sunday Central Time. Um, let's finish with a prayer. In the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. God bless.